Hello and welcome back to Chicago Reacts. My name is Lauren and today we're going to be looking at even fancier drinking. It is an internet historian video that is fairly new. Um, I'm, you know, I've been enjoying the fancy series. I think it's been a lot of fun. Um, but because we're talking about drinking today, we're going back to the classics, we bartending. So I am going to be making an old fashioned. I'm going to smoke it. Um, so that is what we're going to do first. So I've got my ice. My, I, like, I like a big ice if I'm going to be doing an old fashioned. Sometimes I like to pour the whiskey and like pour the, um, the other stuff into like another glass full of chopped ice and then pour it into a, uh, a whiskey glass with a big ice. But today I don't really care. So I've got my, my whiskey, you know, a little bit. That's about two shots in there right now, which is enough. You don't need to go super crazy, but you need to have a little bit more whiskey in there than like some other, like most mixed drinks you use like a shot, like one and a half ounces. This is about two shots. So that's, that's usually enough. I'm going to be using some black walnut bitters because those are my favorite. Um, honestly, like get fancy bitters. If you do not, if all you have is the Agnostora, that's fine. But like invest get something fun get something different i love bitters i'm also going to be putting a tiny like a little a little small bit of simple syrup like like really really a little i am not a huge fan of a lot of simple syrup so i just put like like maybe maybe a quarter of an ounce of simple syrup in my uh old fashions if i'm making them but Again, that's because I just don't really like it. You can always add more sweet to it if you want. And I, like I said, I'm going to smoke it. So I've got my smoker kit. I am using a pear wood this time. I almost dropped everything. That would have been super bad. So here's my, here's my torch. We're excited. Now we just let it go for a moment. See, it's smoking up in there, smoking up in that joint. There we go. Now that's going to take a minute or two to fully, you know, absorb. But we have fun. That's what we'll do. We'll wait. And then we shall begin. Even fancier drinking. Let's go. All right. We've done theater. We've done painting. We've done wine. And now it's time to do some drinking stuff in general. And to start... Let us learn about the drinking cultures of the world. Haha. Okay. Welcome to my private jet. Come on, kid. I got a lot to teach you about the world. I forgot about this character. We must learn all of the drinking customs of all the funny foreign places. Starting with where drinking was invented. The country of Uck. The trick is to jump just before you hit the ground. Observe British people in their natural habitat. The Here pub! they do a thing called cheers, where they clink their glasses together before drinking. Cheers. The tradition dates back centuries, but the origin, why they started doing it, is somewhat unknown. Oh. But we have a couple I always... of theories. Theory one. I thought, yeah, I, my, th my thought about that theory was that it was because... I mean, not necessarily the Brits, I guess, so like Romans, maybe. <laughs> like, I thought that it was like, you clink, splash some of your drink against another person's drink, and that way, if it's poisoned, if they've poisoned you, they're poisoned now, too. Poisoning. Yes. So imagine a situation like this. Two people who don't trust each other, sitting down together at the pub. This guy then does something shady to the other guy's drink. Here you go. Did you poison my drink? Me? I would never. Well then, I'll pour a little of mine into yours, and you can pour a little of yours into mine, and we'll both either be totally fine or both totally dead. No, no, there's, there's no need to do that. So that was the initial version, and then eventually they just kind of shortcutted it to, yeah, clink, clink, it's fine, I trust you. But that's probably a myth. Damn. So theory number two, ghosts. Right, in the Middle Ages, people were worried about spooky ghosts and spirits. 
so they'd do cheers very loudly to scare away the demons. Also, sometimes you'd spill some of your drink onto the table and the floor, and then that was like a little offering to the spirit. But that's probably <laughs> also not true. I mean, I, I would hope not. <laughs> that one. It's like, I mean, it would be a pretty shit ghost if it was scared of a little loud noise, right? I mean, don't the ghosts usually make the loud noises? Most likely answer is simply that everyone likes that sound. Ah, it's very satisfying. There's more. You know when someone drops a glass and everyone just kind of silent, like, oh, you fucking idiot. Oh, I thought that you said, Opa! I thought that's what that happened. Well, in the UK, instead, everyone goes, way in celebration. As a way to make fun of you, but oh. also make That was from Ted Lasso, yeah? I've not actually seen, I've only seen like three or four episodes of Ted Lasso, but I recognize the lady. You feel not so bad. Uh-oh. The BBC. Oh, we do that too, actually. I've done that. You cheer. <laughs> it's like, yeah! <laughs> Woo! Good job. I mean, right now where I'm at, Almost every, like, everybody says, oh, they like, does the Opa thing, which I think is Greek. But, like, regardless of of where I am or where I've been working, like, I've worked at breakfast places, I've worked at bars, I've worked at, like, family restaurants, I've worked at a lot of different types of establishments. And when something falls, people say, Opa. They have a whole organization for that now? We gotta get out of here. We'll take my private cruise ship. Come, come to Italy, where they filmed the Mario movie. Let me just park this here. Where they filmed the Mario movie? Chat, is this actually real? Come this way to the Leaning Tower of Pizza, held up by the raw strength of a thousand tourists posing for photographs. But did yep. you know that Italians, when they say cheers, say chin chin? Now, that is very funny to the Japanese, because in Japanese, chin chin means penis. <laughs> Germany next. Now here they do Bruderschaft, where you oh. I thought they said Prost. Think your arms together when drinking. It's also kind of seen oh. all over the world at weddings in particular, but only the Germans have a name for it. It symbolizes the end of formalities between two people. But the Germans have a lot more. Now when you clink glasses together with someone, you have to look them directly in the eye. Or seven years of bad sex. That's why that like, you do the clink. I mean, that's what I've learned about like shots too. It's like you take a shot with somebody, you have to make eye contact or it's seven years bad sex. And if you don't do it, you will be cursed with seven <laughs> years of bad See? sex, apparently. Told you. It's not my fault. It's the germ. Almost no one believes this superstition. It's just a rude, considered rude. I just thought it was, thought it was funny. Germans. Then when doing shots in Germany, they sometimes also- Oh, is that a B-52? That looks like a B-52 shot. Maybe, kind of, kind Go of. Go, Zer mit, and you hold the glass near your belly. Zer tit, and you hold it near your chest. And then, Zum sack, and you hold it near <laughs> your, you know? And then, Zack Zack, and you drink. Now, on to Finland. Okay, wait, no, no, it says something about Prost, and that's what I thought they said. And you hold it near your chest, and then, Zum sack, and you hold it near your, you know, and then Zack Zack back, and you drink. The this is a more vulgar toast. The standard is Prost, which means something like bottoms up. Okay, so Prost. Now on to Finland. They keep it casual. Oh, Finland. They have a custom specifically for drinking alone. You're supposed to do it oh. around in your underpants, and it's called Kalsari Kalsari. Oh. Also known as underwear drunk. All right, that's all I could find on Finland. So off to Fun. Canada. To get there, I booked us a private fishing trawler. It's so exclusive that even these fish, yes, they go to a private school. In Newfoundland, Canada, they have the Newfoundland Screech. You take a <laughs> shot of Screech, and then you do the Screech. Goes like this. Is you a Screecher? And then you answer like this. Deed I am, me old cock, and long may your big jib draw. That's it. And long may your big jib draw. All right. It's a pirate culture. Then they take a big Fun. fish, usually a cod, and they kiss it on the lips. <laughs> anyway, I'm kind of, I'm kind of busy, so uh, there's no more customs anywhere in the world. You can do some more, maybe uh, independent research yourself. I'll, I'll see you back in the field. Fish, slop, 
fish. Okay, this next section is on cocktails. So it all started when we made this asset where the Irish character, he's shaking a cocktail at a frat party. And I turned to the editor and I went, wait a minute, that's a weird word. Why are they called cocktails? And we started Googling it and we kind of went down a rabbit hole and it was actually really interesting. So here it is. Okay. Why are they called cocktails? In the 1700s, fuel prices were outrageous. So everybody used the horse. (laughs) <laughs> Patent pending. They weren't just used for travel. They were also used... Was that like a clip from Red Dead Redemption? <laughs> ...for work in the fields. So you would sometimes put a harness on a horse for plowing a field, right? Now, when you do that, its tail actually gets in the way. And so we have to do something about that thing. Think of it like the foreskin of the horse. You put it in the guillotine... No. ...and everybody closes their eyes. Problem solved. Now, this practice is called docking. (laughs) It has a different meaning these days. (laughs) Oh, no! (laughs) Oh, (laughs) yuck. Ew. Mm, Anyway, fucking dude, my man... (laughs) Uh, I do kind of remember hearing about that, but like, oh, the horse's little bone goes all the way down. Oh, ow. It's like as bad as declining cats. So once the tail is docked, some say it's much easier to clean. But it also kind of looks like a chicken's tail, right? Hence, they would call these tails cocktails. So that's step one in the story. Step two. You've also got horse merchants, right? And they are a very shrewd bunch. They know that when they sell their horses, the customer wants very feisty and energetic animals. Someone who's buying a horse doesn't want one that's kind of sickly or lazy or sleeping all the time, right? They need it for work. So how do you ensure then that your horse looks full of beans and moxie and some other stuff and has the maximum horsepower possible when it's time to sell? Well, they would use this one quick hack. All the equestrians hate them. They would go (laughs) over to their mortar and pestle and they would throw in some chili, hmm, some ginger, and a few other spices and just mix it all together. Then they would go over to the horse, hold still, little fella, and with the mixture go up into the no-no area. Now, the horse doesn't like that very much, so it's kicking, it's going mad, and the bidders are all going, wow, this is a really great horse. It's got some spunk, I tell ya. I'm buying it. Hey, so kill the you. horse merchants made a whole bunch of money, and everyone was happy. Well, not the horses. Almost everyone. The end. Of step two. Now step three. Around okay. the same time, you've got bartenders over in the saloon, and they have just invented the science of mixology. They've realized that you can add Red Bull and lemon juice <laughs> to stuff and actually make alcohol not taste so bad. But when they added some ginger and spices and maybe a little bit of pepper, people went, oh... I know these. These are those horse suppositories. Cocktails, we'll call them. Glug, 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 glug. And the name stuck. That sounds insane. Do you think it's too early for ad time? I don't think it's too early for ad time. Oh no, help me, Incogni Man. I signed up for discounts at a retail store and they won't stop sending me messages. Huh? I signed up to that website years ago. Why are they still spamming me? That would be my doing. I am Data Beast Man. Okay, we got a bad guy now. It's me, Incogni Man. Incogni is the brilliant service that tells a whole bunch of databases and people who have your data and stuff to get fucking lost. It says, hey, do you have this email address? Well, lose it. Hey, marketer man, you can't use this phone number anymore. Instead of chasing oh, I need one of manually those. by signing up to Incogni. I might need something like that, honestly. I keep getting all of these texts from, like, the Democrats. 
<laughs> telling me, we need your money to defeat the Republican menace. And I'm like, no, you don't. Use your money. You're the millionaires. All of you are the millionaires. So use your money. How about that? And then I won't use my money because I am not a millionaire. And also, I don't agree with a lot of your policies right now, or at least I agree with the policies, but you're not doing anything to implement those policies. And I disagree with my, I'm not spending money on you. Also, I like, it was one of those things, sorry, total tangent, but like, I've been wanting to like participate in polls, right? Because it's like, these polls are blah, blah, blah. And like, I finally got like a message like, oh, you've been chosen to participate in a poll. And I like signed up. I wrote all the things. I was like, yes, I'm going to participate in this poll. And then they were like, how much are you going to pay us to submit this? And I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to pay you to participate in a poll in which I was like, I disagree with what you're doing in a lot of respects. <laughs> Like, what? No. You've gotten rid of a lot of policies that I do agree with, and you're not doing anything to bring them back. And now we're I'm like, no, other other things are going on. We're not going get We're going to not get political. But point is. If incognito can stop me, because like I hit stop on every single one of them, because like they have my phone number, I think, from when I like registered to vote. So it's like just the bots. I just get like a million different texts from like a million. And like, it doesn't matter how many times I hit stop. It just they use a new spammed number to like send me another request for money every like all the time. And I'm just like. Use your own million dollars. They send these legal requests on your behalf to get you deleted from the internet. Let us do battle in my room. And then we teleport to the desert. I better follow him. Incogni portal. Good of you to finally join us. Yeah, well, I'm going to stop you. Incogni lawyer powers, legal threats, data removal tools, Consumer Privacy Act, data protection regulations, polite, Yet stern wording. It has created a Gundam. So go to <laughs> incogni.com slash incognito. Sign up today and get 60% off an annual plan. I won't change numbers. I won't change email addresses. I'll just simply take them back. I can feel it working. My phone isn't ringing as often. My email inbox, it's less full. With the, mm. just a whole bunch of shit. And then, like, the sun, the, the clouds yeah. clear. My databases are getting too light. I'm floating away. Okay. He'll die of the cold eventually. <laughs> Pan up and it's Nord Man. He's like, not bad, kid. <laughs> not bad at all. <gasps> so go to incogni.com slash incognito. Sign up today and get 60% off an annual plan. Add over. Have you heard about the latest dangerous trend? It's all over social media. Wine mixed with watermelon. A combination when mixed together oh. makes a deadly poison. Here we are. That actually sounds pretty tasty. Why? Like, depending on the kind of wine. Ooh. Mm. In Argentina with a delicious watermelon. Now let me chase it down with a glass of... <gasps> Wine? No. Not red. Okay, it's not true. But it's been a myth in South America for over a hundred years that you should never pair wine and watermelon together. Oh, no really? one quite knows why, but we dug. I was just like, ooh, that sounds tasty. <laughs> it's like I've done uh, like vodka infusions with watermelon and I've had these like um, these mixers that you can get that they're like a frozen drink thing and you can mix wine and it's like a watermelon flavoring, I guess. And those always taste good, but like they make it slushy. Yum. Um, I was like, mm, that's a, that sounds amazing. And he's like, apparently there's like a rumor you shouldn't mix them. I'm like, oh. And we dug and we wow. were able to find a single source from an author, Facundo de Genova. He was he holding says, a different book at the time. Probably Argentina, probably sometime in the 1800s, there was a small Catholic church and everything was great for a time. 
Yeah. They grew wine for dinner and watermelon for dessert. Until one day, something bad happened in their idyllic little town. A few men in the village started getting a bit、mm, grabby. It was a whole Me Too thing, but it was the first Me Too. It was a Me One. No one quite knows who did what to whom, but it was a big scandal, I tell you, and it kept happening. Oh no! What's happening to our beautiful our village? They said in their funny foreign accents. Now, presiding over the village was a monastery. So the priests all gathered together at this monastery to figure out what the hell's going on with all this grabbiness. Yeah, this a town a sucks now," said the women folk. I hope you have the plan to fix a this. Ah,、uh, yes, of course we do. But first, we must figure out why the men are becoming so grabby. Come on, guys, think outside the box. We have to find something, anything to blame, except the people who actually did the thing. So、of the course not. Police began looking at the diets of the people in the village. Hmm, the priest said aloud. One of the monks proposed a theory. Have you noticed that we grow a lot of grapes here? Yes. And have you noticed that we also grow a lot of watermelon? Yeah. Well, what if you know somehow it makes the men folk grabby? That must be it. We must put. I mean, the wine. Sure, I can see that. Being a thing, but up to、okay. this. But how? Well, let's tell them that if they drink wine and eat watermelon, they'll go to hell. Okay. So that's what they did. Hear ye, hear ye! Do not drink wine and then eat watermelon. You'll go to hell. Oh, really? 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 I don't know that. Really? 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 And it worked. The assaults suddenly、oh. stopped. I mean, they were drinking less wine, right? Like, makes sense. Hurrah! Although whether that was a coincidence, we don't actually know. Over time, however, the messaging kind of evolved because "don't mix wine with watermelon" isn't exactly a well-known Bible proverb, and people became less religious. So instead of "you'll go to hell," the line changed to "it's poison and you'll die." And in Argentina, in some places, the myth still perpetuates. Now, is there actually? Oh, is this like the if you eat a watermelon seed,、um, it'll grow a watermelon inside of you? Is that is it like that? Any evidence at all that pairing wine and watermelon together really causes the mood? Kinda. Watermelon contains an amino acid, arginine,、okay. which partially transforms into nitric oxide, and then nitric oxide is a vasodilator. And vasodilators、mm. uh, do this. Plus, wine also has polyphenols, and that also helps in the formation of nitric oxide. So, double this. Okay. But the effect from nitric oxide is actually very mild. Also, all of these foods have polyphenols and arginine in them as well. So, pretty much everything has it. So, no, the effects are likely hugely overstated. So. The moral of the story is: don't be an asshole. How about that? This next section is、that. on wine in the Bible. Sort of. Apologies if we got any details wrong. We mostly kept the section because we liked the pun on Eucharist. Ha <laughs> ha! Fun. Okay, so I'm trying to remember the things I remember about wine in the Bible. There are two. Stories that I remember specifically. The first is Noah.、Uh, at some point, he got a little drunk and he was just like laying around naked in his tent or whatever. And his two sons came in and were like, "Ha ha 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 ha, Dad naked, he drunk, lol lol." And then the other son was like, "Y'all are being super disrespectful and rude." And he like covered his dad up. You know, instead of just sitting there making fun of him, and then he was blessed, and the other two were cursed or something.、Um, and then the other one is when Jesus at the wedding of Cana for his first miracle turned the water into wine and made it extra, extra, extra good, and kept that party going all night. Those are the two stories I remember、Jumping、about wine in the Bible.、Jesus. This is his <laughs> first recorded miracle. So Jesus and a whole bunch of his followers and stuff, they are invited to a wedding in Cana. Now the waiter goes over to serve some guests some wine, and uh oh, it's empty. 
That looks like a Game of Thrones guy. There's no more wine. No, wait. I'm it is a Game of Thrones guy. Plan, says Jesus. Bring me six big stone jugs, about 20 to 30 gallons each, and fill them up to the brim with H2O. Now, check out this. And he does the finger thing. And then when they went to pour the water, suddenly it was wine. And a lot of wine. 120 wine gallons. That anyone had ever had. Yup, that's what I remember about that story. He kept it going. You have to drink a lot of it. <laughs> you have to keep going at that point. And they go, oh, that's pretty good, Jesus. But have you got any other miracles? And he says, yes. Come on, we're going to do a supper. Now, everyone is gathered around, and this is the point at which Jesus reveals, by right. the way, one of you is very sus. I know one of you will betray me. And he looks at Judas, and Judas is kind of looking away. But then Da Vinci's like, Guys, uh, I need you to stay uh, still for the painting. So Jesus goes, watch this. And he takes some bread and wine, and he says, Look at this bread. This is my flesh. Wow. And right, I forgot about it. <laughs> He even made a joke about the Eucharist, and I already forgot about it. <laughs> Rod's kind of like, really? And he goes, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're Protestant, then just metaphorically. No, no, okay, look at this wine. It is my blood. Really? Quit making this so complicated. Here, have some. So he hands it to his disciples, and they went, fantastic. I was peckish and thirsty. And he goes, yes, in fact, I shall call this little celebration a Eucharist or Holy Communion. It will be the practice of eating one cracker or piece of bread and drinking some wine. And if you eat the whole thing and drink the whole bottle, that's called a huge caress. Now, most Christians today take that as a symbolic thing. Unless you are Catholic. Now, they believe in what's called transubstantiation. Which means I've that never the understood wine this. Literally turns into the body and blood of Jesus at the moment that they are consumed. However, it does still just... look like bread and wine, and they call that phenomenon appearance or accident. I just I've never understood that, honestly. Like that is never ever tracked for me. I'm like, but what? So, like, what, is he in your brain making illusions happen? Like, what is going on that it is actually turning into blood? So now you're a vampire cannibal, like, every single time. I do not understand. It has changed, but you just can't tell, except for sometimes when you actually can. Lanciano, Italy, in the 8th century, there is a monk, and he has been on r slash atheism for far too long. <laughs> He's starting to have doubts about the blood and wine stuff, but he still has his monkly responsibilities. So, monkly responsibilities. And he says the words of consecration this is my body, this is my blood, this is my rifle, this is my gun. And <laughs> at that very moment, the bread turns into literal flesh in his hands, and the wine turned to blood. Honestly, monstrous. Jesus, man. Holy shit, said everybody in unison. And ironically, he went. Oh, well, I should probably not eat this then. So instead, he kept it in this chalice thing. What is it? A clock? Anyway. It's a reliquary, which is a container made for displaying and storing relics. This one is known as a monstrance. Because, yeah. Uh, well, I did say it was monstrous. Ew. Ew. There it remains still today. Kept Ew. In the San Francesco. And a couple no. of years later, in the 1970s, Professor Odaro Leone decides, let me do a bit of an experiment. So he took a sample of the flesh and he came to the conclusion that it was indeed real. Apparently, it was part of a heart valve and that the blood type was AB. The sample has not been analyzed since. However, it is officially recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. Here ends the reading. Okay. Gross. Now you might Ew. say, wow, that section really doesn't have a whole lot to do with wine. I'm just like, also, just, I'm sorry if, like, that's your, like, whole thing, but, ew? Like, they just kept some randos, like, heart valve and their blood in a cup just for hundreds of years? No. 
that's not real. Or at least it's new. It's like they replace it or something, which is also awful. Oh, that's such serial killer behavior. I'm a little shook <laughs> by that. And look, I'm again, if you're Catholic, I'm sorry. I, I have had Catholic people try to explain that to me before. My dad was raised Catholic. I was not. I was raised Protestant. But like, he tried to explain it to me. I've had friends who tried to explain it to me. It has never, ever, ever made sense. And it will not make sense. And I'm just, I do not, it does not compute in my head. <laughs> like, I can't, I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. And in fact, you're just badly retelling a Bible story. This final section we started making for the main like, channel yes. when we found this massive court document and we thought... We ain't lawyers and there are several cases here taking place over many years with many different parties involved. I struggle to read anything with big words when my mom isn't around to help me sound each syllable out and this is our best attempt at understanding what happened. Understandable also because it is a fucking legal document. Holy shit, this is a hell of a story. And we had all these ideas of it being like Witcher themed and so there were quite a few like random Witcher assets, just ignore that. But it just kept blooming and blooming into this bigger story and it got too long. And so here it is on Incognito. And here we begin in 1743. The birth 1700s of Thomas again. Jefferson. Push, Mrs. Jefferson, push. <laughs> now, Tom Jeff. Yeah. He was involved with some politics. Kind of sexy, but you're too late. He's dead. But what's more important Racist. is he tried his hand at a lot of different hobbies. Architecture. He designed his own home in Monticello. He played the violin. He kept mockingbirds. He collected fossils. And he had a lot of slaves and he was known to force them into having sexual relations with them. Most relevant of all, he hoarded a culture. In his extensive garden, he kept 330 types of vegetables and 170 types of fruit. By which we mean his slaves tended to them. One of those fruits was grapes. So he tried his hand at viniculture. And while he was good at a lot of things, he never saw much success with making wine. So he mostly collected the stuff. Now people naturally wondered, like, hey, what happened to the wine he made and the wine he collected? Did he sell it all? Did he give it away? Did he attempt the huge caress? Fast forward, 1985. Meet German music producer Hardy Rodenstock. He is an avid wine collector. And he's tapping on the walls of old buildings in Paris, looking for some national treasures. On this mm. occasion, the wall opened and, my God. Sealed behind, he said that he found a collection of 24 bottles, dating all the way back to the 1780s and, <gasps> look at that. Lafayette to Mr. Oh, that's cool. I mean, I would believe that uh, he would find Thomas Jefferson wine in France, given to Lafayette or from Lafayette. No, I would believe that. They were friends. Thomas Jefferson liked France. Like, I believe it. THJ engraved right there on the glass. Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> it seems like Mr. Rodenstock has stumbled upon Jeff's hidden collection. Cool. Mystery solved. And it would make sense that they wound up in France because Jefferson spent a number of years over there. Amazing. And into Rodenstock's wine collection, they went. <laughs> now, Rodenstock's wine collection was something quite special, and he liked to show it off. So every year he would host tasting events that featured extremely rare wines. And he would invite all the most prominent German celebrities, such as the Hans Brothers and Das Boot. Was. And Death Stranding. <laughs> and Death Stranding. Because it's Hannibal. <laughs> now, one of his guests was a guy named Michael Broadbent, the senior director for Christie's Auction House. Together, they oh, wow. opened one of the THJ bottles. Bottle number one. Broadbent said that the wine was delicious. Oh. Yup. These bottles are in perfect condition, he said. Weird. You really auction these things. I run an auction. You should put them in there. Huh. Maybe I should. I feel like that's sus. I feel like that's sus as hell. I mean, I guess sometimes wine can... How long does wine really stay good? I know people are like, it's a hundred years old, but I feel like a lot of the time it still tastes kind of like vinegar if it's that old. 
And like it was stored behind a wall. Like it doesn't seem like it had the it was stored in the right condition. Mm. I am suspicious of this, said Mr. Rodenstock. Maybe I should. But before they did that, they sold two of the bottles privately. Number two and number three. And they drank a fourth. On the 5th of December, 1985, they put up bottle number five for auction at Christie's. It was bought by Christopher Forbes for £105,000. Fuck. Of Mr. Forbes of, like, the magazine? Which, at the time, was the most expensive bottle of wine ever sold. Damn. But that wine Defeat. wasn't to drink. Proudly, that thing sat on the Forbes shelf, eventually to be put into the Forbes gallery in the exhibit on former presidents. And funnily enough, they actually put this bottle on display under a big industrial light, and it heated the thing something fierce, and the heat ruined its drinkability, of course. In fact, so intense was the light that the glass expanded and the cork fell into the bottle. <laughs> Some time passed. They Good celebrated job. the sale with another drink. Bottle number six, now gone. And then they sold two more privately. In 1987, they drank bottle number nine. Nin this is such a con. It's got to be a con. But I love that these two are just like having fun with it and just drinking good wine with it. In 1988, they drank bottle number 10. And at this point, a new challenger enters the sea. The White Wolf of Palm Beach. They call him Bill Coke. Some say oh, like the real estate guy? He's a member of one of the wealthiest families in America. And he is also one of the world's most avid collectors of wine. So they sell Shit. him a total of... I would never be able to collect wine because if I open a bottle, I do tend to drink it uh, within two days. Like, it just, it gets drunk. I only open one at a time, generally. Um, unless, a, like, a friend is also drinking it with me, in which case we crush it in a day. But, like... Uh, it doesn't it doesn't last very long in my house like a month tops before i open it it's bad four bottles for three hundred and eleven thousand eight hundred and four dollars we're way over here on the graph at this point so gently careful careful now he put them in his climate controlled cellar and he would show them off to his friends otherwise here they remained for the next 17 Years. As the years ticked by, more bottles were sold and more. <laughs> He's, he originally said he found a dozen bottles, but he kept mysteriously discovering more. Yeah, it's a fucking con. Oh my god. Those were consumed until there were none left. 2005. The four Coke bottles had sat around for a long time on the shelf, doing nothing. When Something new happened. The Boston Museum of Fine Arts was interested in displaying the bottles and wanted to trace the exact provenance. So Coke gets on the line with the Jefferson Foundation and he goes, oh, look, I don't mean to brag, but I'm about to have my bottles displayed at the Boston Museum. Are you? But I need just a little bit of verification. Could you tell me exactly where these bottles come from? And the Thomas Jefferson Foundation responded, oh, I'm afraid we can't do that. We don't think they're real. Yeah. In fact, you're not the only person to call about this. What? Yes, it was in the 80s. A Mr. Broadbent, I believe, of Christie's Auction House called up trying to verify the bottles so that he could sell them. But we looked through our comprehensive historical records and found no mention of these bottles. Here's a letter we sent saying that we couldn't verify them. And they're probably fake. But, 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 he sold those bottles to me. <laughs> I do love it when, when billionaires get scammed for lots and lots of money, even though it's not money that they'll notice because $311,000, whatever, that's pocket change to this guy. But like, and you know, fuck the Christie's guy. But like more power to him also? Like. Now, back to 1776. Now, here's a thing you should know about Jefferson. Let's just say if he was around today, he would play a lot of Factorio. He was, <laughs> okay. You know. And I have the largest collection of Funko Pops in the world. And that meant that his record keeping was very meticulous. All of his anime was ordered alphabetically. And so too were all the things that he ever purchased. Oh, wow. Including wine. So that's my story, Mr. Pepsi. 
And those bottles are probably fake. When Coke hears about this, he hangs up the phone and hits speed dial on his pager or something, and he goes, I need to assemble a team, a team of investigators. Mr. Roden lived in Germany. So, Coke's investigators scoured the countryside for clues, and eventually they found a lead. They managed to track down five German residents who claimed to have done engraving work for Rodenstock in the past. They said, hey, have you seen these bottles before? And they went, oh yeah, we have. We did those. And all five were certain that the THJ engravings were done by an electric power tool. Every one of these 24 bottles of Jefferson wine were fake. Big fat phonies. Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. So they are, Bill takes all for the sure, 100% court, and allegedly. And Rodenstock is summoned, but he doesn't show up. So I say allegedly too. Bill wins in absentia and is awarded a million bucks. He in doesn't end, need that. Bill never... Something about Rodenstock living in Germany in German jurisdiction meant he couldn't be forced to pay. Ha! <laughs> Rodenstock never spoke much on the issue in public, but one time he did offer, well, what's the big deal about wine fraud? Jesus did it. Received any okay. money from Rodenstock. Nice. But to Bill, it was about Good. sending a message more than receiving any money. I'm coming Good. after you. And it's oh, just no. one battle of many that Bill has fought against counterfeit wine. In 2008, Coke filed a consumer fraud lawsuit against the Chicago Wine Company, which was later settled out of court. Another time, Coke spent $3.5 million buying nearly 2,700 bottles of wine from Zaki's auction house. Look, I'm sorry, my man. There are things that you could do with your money that are worthwhile. Just saying. If you have $3.5 million to blow on wine, you have $3.5 million to, like, do something, you know, good for the world. Anyway, fuck billionaires. Almost a third of a million dollars worth was fake. The auction house settled out of court. Good. Swindle seller. him was told to pay $379,000 in damages and another $1,000 for every what bottle. What damages? The wine was still drinkable, right? Like, he could still fucking drink it. I'm sorry. I have no sympathy for him. Fuck Coke. Like, really, this dude? My God. Do something good with your life, maybe. Take any one of the, you know, like the Coke buildings or whatever. You know, maybe make your the rent in those buildings affordable for the average person. How about that? But then the next day, they went, you know what? We thought about it. This jury has decided to award you $12 million in punitive damages. Jackpot, said Mr. Coke. I'm rich. But a year later, the court changed its mind and awarded Coke only $711,000. That's better. Okay, so this guy's like a one-man army, and he's going around trying to scare the shit out of anyone who's selling fake wine. Oh, you've got expensive rare wine, do you? Uh, yes. Yeah, I'll buy it then. Yeah, but no, yeah, I'll buy it. No, it's fine. It's genuine, is it? Yeah, you're saying it's genuine. Yeah, definitely. And then he goes and he inspects it, then finds it's fake, and then goes, yeah, I knew all along, stupid. Lawsuit time. By doing this, he's very slowly cleaning up the market. After all of I don't these care, investigations. Though. Like, there are other markets that you could clean up that are actually, you know, it's a problem that they're dirty. I don't care if somebody is selling well expensive wine that doesn't matter because the people who are going to buy those thousands of dollars worth of wine can afford it. You know, everybody I know spends max $20 on like a bottle of wine. Maybe every so often they'll go to like 30 or if you're at a restaurant up to 60 because like it's a restaurant and they always double up on the actual price of the wine. But like... Look, if you're spending thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars on wine, you can most likely afford to do it. And therefore, I'm not going to have any sympathy for you when it tastes exactly the same as a $25 bottle of wine. And now you're mad? It's like, use that money to do something good or to put it into social programs or something that actually matters. Bill has spent around $35 million tracking down fake wine. But by 2016, I don't care. Coke was ready to lay down his weapons. He sold off a big chunk of his collection, and it sold for $22 million. Wow. Which means he likely did not break even. So consider giving to his GoFundMe. 
Now, this is actually just a very small part of the story. This scandal ended up making such waves across the wine industry that they decided to make a movie about it. Based on the Benjamin Wallace book, The Billionaire's Vinegar. And it was set to star Brad Pitt. No, wait, now it's Matthew McConaughey. No, wait, it looks like it's cancelled. Oh, no. All right, that's the video. Thanks for watching. Four more to go, but we've already started in on the regular type stuff in case you don't love fancy. Okay, bye. And don't forget, incogni.com slash incognito. Okay, that was the video. I feel like we learned some stuff. I went on a couple of, of unhinged rants there about billionaires and Catholicism. So those are two different things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> don't know how that happened, but... I hope you enjoyed. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video. Bye.